So um, the recording now should have started. Um, thank you all ever so much for joining us for our short workshop around data management planning and overcoming challenges in social science data sharing. Um, this is the first day of the workshop, a two and a half hour session um, on the 14th of February. What better day to show how much we love data than on Valentine's Day? So um, a couple of housekeeping notes, the presentations are being recorded so you can use them at your own pace and your colleagues as well. Everything is made available under a CC BY license, so please feel free to share them and reuse them as much as possible. The Q&A session and the exercises will not be recorded. We want everyone to feel comfortable. Um, please do uh, make sure to ask any questions you might have. What we have done, we have prepared a Google Drive for you uh, with the slides of the day. They're now in the chat, the links with the slides available. We also have a Padlet for anonymous questions. If you go on the Padlet, you can just ask the questions um, as you would like. And we have the post feedback event, um, which you can complete after tomorrow. Now, um, I am Christina. I am the Collections Development Manager at the UK Data Service. Um, and I am very pleased in the um, interest the event has gathered. Data management planning is very important. And I'll, as we'll see throughout the days, it actually allows us to share data ethically and legally. And most of the times um, helps us not have headaches. Oh, what um, can I do? Um, to actually be able to share the data. Our colleague Hina Vahid sadly is, ava is not available to join us today. Um, she has been very kind in sending her previous slides um, in research she has done about ethical and legal consideration. So I have prepared the short presentation on behalf of her, but it couldn't have been done um, without her tremendous knowledge and help. And we also have our colleagues Anka Vlad and Maureen Hacker. Anka today is going to present around um, management and curation of data Data, including anonymization, pseudo anonymization, quality assurance and security. And we also have our colleague Maureen um, that is going to present tomorrow around um, existing data sources and how to make use of data um, that is currently made available. So a little bit about us. Uh, we come from the UK Data Archive, the lead partner at the UK Data Service. Um, the title says it, we are based in the UK um, and we're going to see when it comes to legal and um, ethical consideration, we have included a little bit about the UK GDPR, like the EU GDPR was not enough. Um, we are funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, which is part of the UK Research and Innovation. Um, and we actually host the largest collection of social science and population data in the United Kingdom for over 50 years. We do provide a trusted digital repository and we are really keen in sharing best practices when it comes to data management. We ourselves are based at University of Essex. However, today we will not be here without our shock um, funders. Um, if you have not heard of shock before, we have included a lot of links. The slides are available. Please make sure to use them. Shock stands for the Social Science and Humanities Open Cloud, um, and the objectives of the projects are to create. Um, a cloud that provides enough materials, tools, data for other in the social sciences to use and to actually be an advocate of fair data sharing. And we're going to see, we'll, we'll be discussing the fair principles later on. Now, what does shock offer from your perspective, um, shock does have on and offline training um, and training materials. Um, and I'm highlighting the training materials. Most of them are available under a CC BY license. Um, so you can use them in your own training for your own development. And it does provide an international and cross-disciplinary trainer network. So of course, as trainers, how do we engage better with the audience? How do we make everyone feel comfortable? It is a fantastic network in providing advice and actually, um, I would say, bouncing ideas from one to another. We do have the open marketplace as part of SHOCK as well. And we can see here um, the training resources. There has been a lot of different trainings provided by SHOCK. Again, if you are not familiar with SHOCK, please do visit the website. Most of the events are recorded. And as of um, with the event today and tomorrow, the presentations are recorded for future use and the materials are made available. 
we do have the open marketplace as well, where we can see different open data sets you can use in your teaching or in your training, um, and different materials that you can use um, to actually enable people to share um, their data. Now, uh, what I have done, I have strayed away from um, what I usually do when it comes to icebreakers, but I found this fantastic poll everywhere, and I'm going to paste the link in the chat now. Um, link is in the chat, it's a tiny URL. Um, if you'd like to go to the um, poll everywhere, we are still getting people joining us um, Yes, um, hello, hello. Um, thank you ever so much for, for joining us. We are just doing a tiny icebreaker. Um, and again, straight away um, from Menti, we're using poll everywhere. If you'd like to click on the link in the chat, um, I was curious to see where um, people are joining us. So again, when we're thinking about shock, shock actually brings together people from various countries with various laws and regulations in place. So it's very nice to see a variety of people um, from different places joining us. Now I am just going to present where are we from. Many different places from Europe, UK, Finland, Germany, Italy. That's fantastic. We have people from everywhere joining us. Um, this is great and I hope it will actually help us have some discussions around how data management planning differs from one country to another one. We're going to be seeing elements that are in common from one country to another one um, in the difference when it comes to um, legislation as well. Now, I'm going to activate the second poll um, just to get to know each other a little bit better. Um, just a couple of questions, hopefully nothing too tedious. Um, what are your research interests? Um, it can be anything. Are you interested in um, social science? What kind of social science? Um, are you interested in, for example, medical research? Any um, research interest you might have. I am putting again the tiny URL in the chat. Thank you ever so much for joining us. I can see people still coming um, um, in the um, waiting room. So I will just now. Um, so we can see a variety of research interests from culture to management to information, social sciences. We can see that's quite big digital sociology. Um, project information, medication, health, ethics. This is fantastic. We have such a variability um, of research interests today. Um, and we're going to see how in the different disciplines, actually having a data management plan helps us share the data um, and make our life easier overall. So have you ever collected data for a research project? Um, yes. Everyone um, that has replied now um, he said, yes, that is fantastic. Let's see the next one. Have you ever conducted secondary data analysis? Again, yes is in the lead 82%. Um, and we have, no, it, it keeps moving. 77, yes, 23, no. So again, quite a um, majority have conducted secondary data analysis. And to bear in mind, if you can use data management plans, and it's actually encouraged to use data management plan for secondary data analysis as well. Oh, the balance is steeping a little bit. Uh, we have 33 with no um, in 67 with yes. Um, have you ever prepared a data management plan? This is very interesting. We have had a hundred percent um, conducted research, collected data, um, but we have 44% of the attendees never conducted a data management plan. So we do hope the sessions um, we have organized for you are coming in handy. We can see the, the, the balance keeps moving, 56, 44. Um, it would actually help you to see how a data management plan can help. And it's more than just bureaucracy. Oh, I just need to complete another two pages. No, it act, it's actually to help you in the research data life cycle um, overall. 
that that would be it for our icebreaker. So what I'll do, I'll go back to my PowerPoint. So what are the learning objectives? Um, we hope by attending this um, short workshop, two and a half hours, two and a half hours, you will be able to recognize the different challenges in data sharing and actually by looking at the data management plan, be able to identify techniques to overcome this. We hope you will gain a better understanding of what data management planning requirements in social sciences are. And we're going to see it's quite different from an institution or a funder to another one. There's so many different templates, but there's actually quite a core focus in all of them. And hopefully with the exercise that we're doing tomorrow, uh, which can be done individually or as a group, we're going to see we give um, a lot of options here, be able to design a data management plan that actually enables data sharing. So for day one program, um, we of course had the welcome and the intro, and we're going to dive in into an introduction for data management planning in social sciences. We're going to be looking at different templates, different requirements, standards um, that are used in social sciences and why do we include them in the life cycle but also in the data management plan. Ethical yeah. considerations, I'm just going to in the ethical and legal consideration, again, we're looking at things from an ethical and legal perspective. How do we ensure that we can actually share the data for future use in an ethical and legal matter? We're going to be looking at data protection legislation um, and at different techniques to make sure, such as consent, that we're able to share the data. We're then going to have a short break. It's really important to um, stretch our legs, make sure that we're fine. Uh, we don't have um, backaches or anything. Um, so we're going to have a short break at 11, just a 15 minute break. And we're coming back with a presentation from my colleague, Anka Vlad, about management and curation of data, which includes how you anonymize data, how you pseudonymize data, a lot of further resources there. Is, we can't um, even cover half of that in just 45 minutes. There's going to be a lot of information covered there with further resources. We're going to be looking at how do we conduct quality assurance for data and how do we make sure that we back up our data and we ensure that the data is secure at all times. We have seen that Padlet works fantastically well for Q&A sessions, so we've decided to add at the very end the 20 minute sessions for questions. Uh, you can, of course, unmute yourself again and um, ask any questions you might have, but you can also put them in the Padlet. They're anonymous and we're just going to discuss, take them one by one um, and discuss them. And of course, we're going to be finishing with the close of the day. So now that we have the very first presentation, the intro over, we can actually start looking at data management planning. And I have just tried to do a presentation in a presentation that doesn't seem to, to want to work. So from the beginning, data management planning in social sciences. The presentation is going to be around 30 minutes and we're going to be looking at objectives of data management planning. So why do we actually have to do this? We're going to be looking at fair principles, data management plan templates, standards in social sciences, just a couple of examples, um, and also the UK data service checklist when it comes to data management planning. So before starting to discuss around data management planning, we need to bear in mind that, of course, data is not static. Data exists in this research data life cycle. So we start by planning our research, we've collected our data, we process and we analyze, we're very happy with what we've analyzed, we can publish in different journals, we can start sharing our data, by sharing our data, we actually preserve it for long-term use. So others can start reusing the data and the cycle begins again. We are planning the research, we are collecting the data, be it primary or using secondary data for existing resources, but the cycle continues. So a data management plan aims to describe how data is collected, how the data is organized and managed, and that is from the very beginning when the data is collected throughout the research project 
and beyond preservation, and also how the data will be shared. Now, why do we need data management planning? And I've said in the intro as well, the main important thing um, to bear in mind here is data management planning should not be used just to think, oh, it's just another bureaucracy we need to do. We need to um, add this um, just to make our lives harder. No, we're actually going to be seeing that data management planning is taking a lot of our headaches that we might have because it plans, it helps you plan ahead. So what types of data will I have? How do I keep track of my data? How do I keep track of my resources? Especially when we're talking about big research teams, and I'm saying big research teams, but that could be five or six or seven different people. If we're talking about research teams, people might leave, people might go off sick, et cetera. Actually having a data management plan with responsibilities in place is going to be able to help you plan in time accordingly. It helps you identify the different support and resources that you might need. And you will see throughout the presentation, we do refer to please contact your institution, especially when it comes to um, storage, more and more now universities provide their own trusted research environments. They provide different um, tools to actually save data in a secure, confidential way. So it's always good to check with your institution. It helps you plan um, security and consider the ethical and legal aspects. You'll see in data management planning, um, in all of the templates, there are sections about ethical and legal considerations. When you deal with data, do no harm, seek no harm. So how do we ensure that we are not doing any harm to participants. We just need to make sure that our consent form information sheets are in place, et cetera, et cetera. It plans long-term sharing and it makes you start thinking about, okay, so I'm collecting my data for this specific project. However, other people might see a different usage to my data. We come from UK Data Service where a lot of different government departments are actually sharing their, their data for secondary um, reuse. We're very lucky in the UK that the government is very open um, in sharing the data and we see on a daily basis how many secondary users take, for example, the annual population survey or the crime survey for England, for, for Wales, and they develop a very interesting um, research hypothesis, and they actually lead to policy changing um, research as well. So thinking in ahead of time, how do I plan to use my, how do I plan to share my data? Who might be using my data? What would they actually need to um, use my data in an um, ethical and legal matter. And of course, having a data management plan in place, it actually makes um, data fairer. And, oh, my space did not work there. The fair principle for publishing data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Probably most of you have heard of the FAIR principles. They have been coined by Force 11, um, and they're more and more used in social sciences. And it's all about making data more accessible, more um, of use to secondary researchers. And I will not go each and every one, because we are actually having the DMP um, from um, Europe Horizon that has clear... Um, sections on how to make the data fairer. So we're going to see there uh, with clear examples what we're referring to. To bear in mind, when we're talking about data management plans, do check with your funder or your host institution. They do different from one another. So you might have, for example, um, if in the UK, you are funded by UKRI, you have a data management template, but if you are funded by the MRC, which is the Medical Research Council, you will have a different data management template. And the same is in Europe, you might have institutional university data management templates, but you might also have something like the Horizon Europe um, template. So Horizon Europe is actually the predecessor of um, Horizon 2020 that funded the shock project. Um, and their data management plan is very straightforward to use. The very first section is providing a data summary. So when we're looking at the data summary, one needs to consider what is the purpose of the data you're collecting or 
the data that you are reusing. So again, it could be um, secondary data analysis. What are the types, the formats, and the size of the data? Again, either new or secondary data. If you are using secondary data, what are the existing data sources? And here is very important to mention where they come from. And we're going to see it actually affects the ethical um, and legal implications because what if the data is under a very bespoke license? What if it's a third party license that you cannot actually publish anything that's derived, et cetera, et cetera. And we also need to think about data utility for others. So I'm, I'm conducting my own research for my own purpose, but how can others use the data? How is the research community benefiting from the project I'm conducting? As I said, Horizon Europe is very focused on fair data. It has actually a section around fair data, making data findable. So that means what kind of metadata will you have with your um, collection? What kind of standards will you be using? Will you be indexing your collection? How will you be indexing your collection? Will you have a persistent identifier in the data? And what kind of versioning and naming conventions will you be using throughout the um, data lifecycle? Will you be making the data openly accessible? And by openly accessible, I feel like I need to put a um, wording here, um, there are situations under which data needs to be more closed rather than open. So um, if data requires a license that, for example, requires registration with a data service provider or requires um, permission, that is all fine as long as there's a rationality there for doing that. So you just need to specify how you will make that data available and if there are restrictions, why there are restrictions very similar to how data access statements are now in different journals. Will there be methods or tools needed to access the data or will you actually have to develop something like that? So of course, there are various different formats of delivering data. And sometimes you might have data delivered via bespoke platforms that need to be created. So if that is the case, just mentioning that or mentioning that the data will be made available in a CSV format or in an RTF format for transcripts, et cetera, and no um, methods will be used to um, use it. How will you be archiving your collection and where? What repository will you be using? And actually identifying the different standards that are used by said repository is very important. Moving forward, we also have making data interoperable. And again, now we're talking about controlled vocabulary. So how will others be able to use your data instead of reinventing the wheel? So to say, it's always best to use methodologies and standards that are already used in the social sciences. And again, we're covering a couple of them today. How are you going to include the data reuse? of your own collection. How is the data going to be licensed? Again, it could be a Creative Commons open license, it could be a bespoke license, and why? Will it be requiring an embargo? A dissemination embargo is fantastically useful when there's a lot of different publications coming out from a data collection, and host institutions and funders do realize sometimes you collect data and you might need six months extra to publish everything that you want. So dissemination embargoes, if needed, need to be mentioned. To bear in mind is we do not advise of dissemination embargoes longer um, than 12 months, because again, data usability with time can decrease. What are the data quality assurance processes that you'll put in place? How will you make sure that the data you make available is of high quality and others can use it? And also how will you preserve the data? Is that something that the repository will ensure long-term preservation, which is the case for most of them, or is preservation done via your institution? The third section is around other research outputs. So of course you might have a um, research project, you're collecting data, but you are also coming up with different protocols or you are creating software, as I said, different dissemination platforms. Are those going to be shared? And if yes, trying to apply FAIR to all the other research outputs you might have. So 
say I'm developing a new platform for disseminating my data, I'm going to make that new platform available under a GNU license via GitHub so that other people can use my platform for their data. Fourth section is concerning allocation of resources, so responsibilities. How much it will cost to, to make the data fair? And here is about the money and also the people. How many people will you need to actually ensure that the data you make available is going to follow the fair principles? Who is going to be responsible in terms of data management? Will you go into have different um, people looking at quality assurance, backup security, et cetera, et cetera. And also actually arguing the potential value for long-term preservation, especially when long-term preservation comes with the cost associated to it. Fifth section is around data security. And here we're talking about how the data will be stored, recovered, how will you transfer sensitive data if you have any sensitive data, and how the data will be archived. Now to bear in mind with data security, depending on the data, data security might be harsher or less harsher. Um, we were just talking um, last week, um, and Maureen, my colleague mentioned, for example, she took part in a very big um, governmental survey here in the UK. And when they came to actually do the survey, the laptop they were using, because it is sensitive special category data under UK GDPR, it actually had a lock on the laptop. So the laptop was already encrypted, but it had a physical lock on it as well. So um, that's a bit of an anecdote. Um, we also have a section clearly around ethics. So in this section, what needs to demonstrate that you have taken into account all the considerations, ethical and legal consideration, when it comes to data sharing. And Horizon Europe actually now asked, clearly asked, will informed consent for data sharing and long-term preservation be included in the questionnaires dealing with personal data? So they've actually made it a compulsory requirement to answer this question now. Um, hello, welcome everyone. I can see um, other people are joining us. Um, so we have in the chat again the slides where they are available um, and also the Padlet for questions. Please do put different questions onto the Padlet. Finally, we have a section around other issues and this is to basically take into account are there any national, departmental, um, procedures that you need to bear in mind when you are um, doing um, your collection. And again, this could vary from, say, copyright. There are a couple of institutions that might require joint copyright for the collection that you're covering, while um, others might be around data security and data storage. So always check with your funder in your institution any requirements they need to put in place. Now, by contrast, this is the ESRC, so our funders, the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK, they have their own DMP template, which um, asks researchers to think about existing data sources. If you've identified the gap into existing data sources, what is the new data that you collect and how, that, how does that link to the existing data sources? How will you ensure the quality assurance of the data? We can see here the patterns. How about the backup and security of the data? How will you manage and curate the data throughout the research data life cycles? Are there any difficulties in data sharing and what will you put in place to overcome this? So ESRC are actually very clear on you might identify X, Y, Z as difficulties. What are the measures you put into place um, to actually overcome this? What are the consent, anonymization, and reuse strategies that you're going to put? And again, here is around principles in different methodologies that are used, controlled vocabularies, etc. Copyright and intellectual property sits a bit um, different. Again, this would be an ethical and legal consideration. Is the copyright going to be yours? We're going to see there are actually some considerations when we're talking about secondary data analysis. How do we deal with that? What are the responsibilities within the research team? And how will you ensure that the data is all ready and um, good for sharing and data archiving? So 
if we look at the two different DMP plans, yes, they have slightly different sections, but actually it's all about description of data, the new one, an existing one, or just the existing one, management and curation of data, like quality assurance, documentation, metadata, storage and backup, so everything about security, legal and ethical considerations, data protection legislation, consent, data sharing, how will you enable data sharing, what kind of license might the data be made available under, responsibility and resources, looking at your research team, I have three research assistants, et cetera, et cetera. So metadata standards. Um, most um, social science data archives actually use the data documentation initiative, DDI, and you've probably heard of it. But of course, depending on the different sector one might come from, there are other metadata standards that can be used. We have geographic for geographic information, we have computer science, we have specific for archives. But in social sciences, we're looking at the data documentation initiative, DDI, which provides a rich and detailed metadata designed specifically for social sciences. So it's very on the topic. This is why social science archives actually use DDI. The DDI catalog, so we have catalog metadata that describes the collection, has both mandatory and optional fields. And here we're talking about um, an abstract, so a description of the data collection, the temporal coverage, the collection period, if they differ, why do they differ, um, the sample population. They have very um, key concepts that will be used in a standard DDI compliant catalog record. We also have data file descriptions, including the file type, the file structure, if there are any missing data, weighting variables, software used, and more and more social science data archives are now looking and actually using the DDI lifecycle, so using it more for variable discoverability as well, besides the catalog metadata. Control vocabulary. And here I gave the example from our home, UK Data Service. Um, we actually have the Humanities and Social Science Electronic Thesaurus in the multilingual version, the European Language Social Science Thesaurus. Has it, the, the one that's in English is hosted by UK DS, while else the one in multi, um, in many lang languages um, is hosted by SESTA. They both cover core social science disciplines. They're always in sync. So if something changes, it will change in both. It does follow ISO protocols and it has interoperability with other vocabularies as far as possible. And they are available in the link open, open data format scores. So anyone can use them and make use of them in their own repositories if they want to do so. The one thing to bear in mind when depositing data with a repository, do they use different control vocabularies? What control vocabularies are they using? And in the data management plan, you could actually mention, I'm going to deposit the data via a repository that uses ELST, for example. So indexing will be done using these core social science topics to enable um, further discoverability. Persistent identifiers, we keep hearing about persistent identifiers. They're fantastically useful in actually having your work referenced and also linking the different works that you might have. We have the open researcher and contributor ID, work IDs. Many different repositories are using work ID to identify different researchers. We use that in our self deposit repository, we share. But we also have digital object identifiers, DOIs, for data collections. So these DOIs clearly link to a specific data collection, and they can be versioned as well to make sure that, say, for example, um, you have identified some errors in a previous data collection, you want to address those um, errors that you have identified, you make a new version available, so we can actually version the DOI to clearly note um, it is a new version of the data. 
Now, we have developed a checklist that comes in handy when you're writing a data management plan. It is available on our website. And again, we'll see we have further resources with different links. Um, so you can, you can always make use of them. And for the data checklist, data management plan checklist, we have looked at different sections. So for planning, thinking who is responsible for different aspects in data management planning. Also thinking of skills, um, and why I'm saying that, especially with new forms of data, is good to bear in mind, do we need different skills than we have in-house? I don't know, someone to develop a scraper, a web scraper, say, for example. Do you need extra resources? This could be time or people or even hardware. Maybe your collection is so big, you actually need different hardware to keep it on. If you accounted for all the costs associated with depositing data for longer term, and most repositories don't have a cost in depositing the data. However, to bear in mind, preparing data for deposit, it is time um, consuming, it is resource um, and time consuming, it's both of them. So bear in mind, how much time will you need to actually prepare the data for reuse? Um, and how do you ensure others can make use of it? Documenting the data. So we'll, I have my collection, I'm looking at it, I know my data, but will others be able to make use of my data? Do I provide enough documentation with my data? Do I provide enough metadata? Are the naming conventions okay? So it actually makes sense. Um, here, for example, when it comes to variable names, rather than just having var 01, var 02, actually having, for example, gender, age, age, child, et cetera, et cetera, to make, um, to make it easier to be understood. How will you organize the data in the file? So the entire collection talking about the documentation as well. Um, and will you be consistent in how the data will be cataloged? So again, we've talked about the DDI, the, um, DDI um, standards when you're thinking about actually uploading the collection again most repositories do use ddi um, standards so bearing in mind when we're planning who is actually going to upload the data and complete the catalog record hence making our um, collection ddi compliant formatting are you using perfect formatting for the data that you provide are they actually enable second, the secondary use and also long-term preservation? So here we're thinking about going rather further away than proprietary software and moving into the open science world. So while you might be having your data in SPSS format, a lot of people use SPSS and Stata, both of them are proprietary software. So what if we look also at a CSV version as well? And again, you can provide different software versions in your data collection to enable better um, reuse. Also, when you are converting the data from one format to another one, and for our users, it does, um, it does happen. When you convert it from SPSS, form, for example, to another format, what are the quality assurance things that you have in place to ensure that that data is correct? Um, another example would be when you transfer from SPSS to Stata, Stata truncates everything to 60 characters. So again, there might be some differences there. Storing. How will you store the data? Will you have multiple copies, uh, both physical, and online, of course, now more and more, we're using different cloud um, facilities to store the data. And again, to bear in mind is talk with your institution. That is the best advice when it comes to storing data because they usually have their own platforms where the data can be stored safely, it's backed up, and they can actually provide you with the information that you need to put in your data management plan. If you do keep data in multiple places, how will you ensure that versioning is okay? Do you know which is the master file? Which are copies? How are you going to ensure you don't um, uh, confuse them uh, between themselves? Who will access the data while you're doing the research? Is it the entire research team? Is it half of the research team or part of the research team? How will the data be stored 
once you are sharing it for reuse, how will that repository that you're depositing the data with make the data available? And how long will you store your data for? And here we have the following presentation about ethical and legal, um, but to bear in mind, especially when it comes to personal data, institutions do have their own requirements. Even in the UK, sometimes they, they differ. So you might have institutions that say personal data can be retained for five years. You need to delete the personal data as soon as it's no longer needed or some of them even have 10 years. So again, check with your institution. Confidentiality, ethics, and con consent. Looking at data, have you collected confidential or sensitive information? And if so, have you actually been transparent with the, research, with the participants that the data will be shared for future use? Are you gaining written consent from them? Are you gaining verbal consent? Again, what type of consent are you, are you using? And do you need to anonymize the data before actually sharing it for the use? So um, in qual circumstances, especially when we're talking about data with public figures, and here might be people from the parliament, for example, they're very happy for their name to be shared um, and they don't, they don't require anonymization. However, when we're talking about um, just say we do a research with people using a certain service, um, they don't want their name or any identifying information to be shared in the consent form you have specified anonymized data will be shared. How will you anonymize the data? Do you have all the techniques in place? And this includes things like transcriptions as well that um, ensures that the data is prepared for sharing. Now, copyright. And again, copyright, we're going to be discussing it in the legal and ethical from both the primary and the secondary um, alternative. Um, and again, if you can actually use um, secondary data, do make sure that you check the licenses. Cannot say that um, more um, than enough because it is usually a common challenge when it comes to secondary data. Sometimes researchers use secondary data and they think they can share it. They come to a repository and when we actually check the licenses, half of the data cannot be shared because it was under a third party bespoke license. So have you established who owns copyright? It could be you, it could be the institution as well. Again, check if the institution would want copyright on the set data collection. An example here would be, for example, at the University of Essex, we have um, Understanding Society, which is done by um, the Institute for Social and Economic Research, again, funded by ESRC, uh, but University of Essex does have copyright in that collection. It's not only ISOs that have copyright. What kind of license will you be using? And is that appropriate for the level of detail that you are actually sharing? And is it as per the consent forms you have used? If you've purchased your data, what was in that contract? Does it allow the use? Maybe it doesn't. Can you actually go back now and check would it be possible to publish derived data from it? And can you preserve for long-term personal information so that it can be used in the future? So when it comes to sharing, again, we need to be thinking, do you know how you will be sharing the data? So we're thinking, what repository am I putting the data in? Is it feasible for me to put the data there? You can always have a discussion with the repository as well. If you're quite not sure, I would say, whether your collection is within the remit of a specific repository, you can always contact them and double check. I'm conducting this research. I would like to deposit my data with you. Would that be within the remit? And they can better advise. If it is an institutional repository, they usually accept it as long as there are no ethical and legal um, problems. How and where is the place? Ideally, you need to have a clear, um, I would say image. So rather than saying, oh, I might put it in my institutional repository, but then actually it's really social science data. So I want a lot of people to use it. What if I put it in UK data services? Well, ideally you don't want duplication of DOI. So if you're sharing the data via 
a responsible repository that provides that DOI, a persistent identifier for the collection. You don't want to duplicate that into another repository. You just want to publish it in one, make it available and discoverable. And again, how will you be making the data available? So we're thinking about the license. If I'm putting restrictions, why am I putting restrictions? Are this appropriate with the data that I'm sharing? Or am I to risk others? Again, when it comes to licenses, repositories are a fantastic help to check. Is my rationale okay? Does it make sense for me to actually make this data available under a more restrictive license? Or can I share it via Creative Commons or Open Data Commons license? So that was it when it comes to data management planning standards, principles. Again, all the slides are available on the Google Drive. I'm just adding again, as I see we have, um, we have had a couple of more people joining us. So I have added in the chat again, the link to the slides um, and also the link to the Padlet for questions. Any questions you might have, please do put them in the Padlet or in the chat, I will pause the recording. So now we'll be looking at ethical and legal considerations when it comes to data management planning and why it's important to take them into account. So we're going to be looking at the key principles when it comes to ethical research, our duty of confidentiality, different data protection legislation, how it applies from one country to another one, consent in research, and we're going to see we can use consent for people to take part in research, but also as a legal basis for processing personal data. And as I said previously, copyright considerations. So the main principle when it comes to ethical research is do no harm. As the doctors, we researchers need to ensure that we minimize um, any risk and harm that would come to our participants or the society of our participants as well. And we need to respect our participants throughout the research life cycle. And that means respecting their option of even sharing or not sharing the data. This is why we always talk about granular consent and informed consent, allowing people to choose, yes, I want my data to be shared under set conditions. No, I would prefer not, or I would like part of my data to be recorded. Participation needs to be voluntary and informed, and we're going to be looking how we can ensure that by having a very nice information sheet and granular consent form. It's really important to define the lines of responsibilities and accountability, and especially with GDPR now, we will see in the information form, we actually need to specify who is the data protection officer, how do I make a complaint if I want to make a complaint. And also, if there are any conflicts of interest, this is quite rare, but if there are any conflicts of interest, be transparent about them and tell um, your participants about them. Best practices, again, do no harm, so avoid the social and personal harm. In thinking about the ethical obligations, again, in the research life cycle. So we're not only thinking when you're collecting the data, but we're thinking about the ethical considerations when we're processing the data, when we're storing the data, can someone actually steal that data from me? And of course, now we have so many different um, hackers um, in incidents that are happening. So keeping that data safe is important, but also ethical considerations when we're sharing that data. Am I sharing that data as I promised um, to my researchers? It's very important to comply with relevant laws. And again, this might be, for example, the EU GDPR, but you might also have national specific laws depending on the country that you need to be aware of, especially when processing personal data. No, and that's why we keep insisting we do have a chat with your institution. What is your host institution stance on processing personal data? What is, for example, the legal gateway? Most universities in the UK, they actually use public interest to process personal data. Is that something that you will be using? And do know and um, try to do some research around the different data centers and repositories where you can archive your data. Get in touch with them as soon as possible. If you have any concerns of, if say I am collecting sensitive data from migrants, 
um, they have consented, but I am still worried about the sensitivity of the data. How can I best protect them? And then they can start a discussion about the different licenses available to make sure that the, the no harm um, is done to the participants. So duty of confidentiality exists in common law and may apply to research data and disclosure of confidential information is lawful either when the individual consented, either if the disclosure is needed to safeguard the individual or within the public interest, as we've seen with UK GDPR, or there is a legal duty to do so, such as a court order example. And the best practice here is to avoid very specific promises in consent forms. Data protection considerations, I've tried to give a couple of examples. So let's say I'm a researcher based in a country from the European Union, and I'm collecting personal data from people living in a European Union country. Then we have the EU GDPR with different country specific laws. So again, please make sure to check your country specific laws as well. If, for example, I'm based in the UK, I am collecting personal data about people anywhere in the world, or I am collecting data about people in the UK, both the Data Protection Act from 2018 and the UK GDPR apply as well. To make it more complicated, UK now has the UK GDPR besides the EU GDPR, and if as I am based in the UK, I decide to collect research data about citizens of the European Union. I have the Data Protection Act, the EU GDPR, and also the UK GDPR all apply. Currently, there isn't much of a trouble between EU and UK GDPR. UK GDPR basically mimics EU GDPR, but there might be some changes coming in due course. How fun for researchers working in the UK. Consent in research. So, why are we seeking for consent? We need to make sure that participants understand what the study is about and what their participation is actually doing the research, that the research is conducted in a very ethical way, and that we comply with data protection legislation. So we have the consent for research ethics, we provide information, we clearly describe the risks, if there are any risks, any benefits, and we actually allow participants to voluntarily participate in our research. But we also have consent used as a legal basis for the processing of personal data under GDPR. And a very common example here is actually the linkage of administrative data. So in very numerous um, scenarios, you might have a survey um, which can actually link with, let's say, medical records, for example, that can happen under consent, that linkage, and again, sharing of that data as well. So in an information sheet, we want to cover the purpose of the research, what is involved um, when it comes to participating. So let's say it's going to be a 45 minute semi-structured interview. What are the benefits and risks of participating? What is the procedure for withdrawal? What if they don't want to take part anymore? How will the data be used during the research, so your own project, but also how will the data be used by other researchers, so future reuse? How is the data going to be stored, published, and archived? Also looking at how um, can people make a complaint, and again, I've um, just probably a couple of minutes ago, time uh, flies when you're having fun, mentioned with the UK GDPR and the EU GDPR, we need to mention the data protection officer contact details uh, for any complaints problems. In the consent forms, try to use simple language and free from any big words. Um, try to be as understandable as possible and give the participant the option to say, yes, I read and I understood. I have asked questions or I was allowed, I was given the opportunity to ask any questions. I agree voluntarily to take part of this. I agree for my data to be shared for future reuse under XYZ circumstances, um, and also um, keeping the consent form with their signatures and dates. The UK DS model consent form can be used by researchers to gain informed consent, and it pays particular attention to ensure that the research data can be curated and made available for future reuse.
So we are referring to it as granular consent. It has three separate sections taking part in the study, again, explaining what the study is about, use of the information in the study. So while you are doing your research, how that data will be used, but also future use and reuse of information by others, where the data will be hosted, how it's going to be used. You can always make use of our model consent form and just adapt it for your own needs. Best practices for personal data, always think, do I need to collect this personal data or is it not needed? For example, if I'm, co if I'm collecting email addresses, do I also need to contact uh, to collect the phone numbers or not? Indicate in the consent form how the personal data is going to be used whether it is under consent or another legal um, gateway, keep consent forms under constant reviews and actually um, use different ones depending on the different materials that you are collecting. So for example, you might have a very big grant that has different word packages and you might collect um, semi-structured interviews um, as audio recordings. Um, if you want to make the audio recordings available, of course, the voice of someone, the recording of the voice, his personal data. So actually consent for sharing that personal data needs to be in place. Um, or if you are collecting diary information, again, it's written, make sure that you have copyright clearance in there, et cetera, et cetera. Copyright consideration, um, you have copyright once you create something, it's an automatic right, you don't need to register, you just have it. Always check when you're using secondary data who the copyright owner is and how can you reuse that information. I can't stress enough, if something is online, it doesn't mean it's copyright free. Uh, it might actually be under some very strict terms and conditions. So while you might be using different exemptions, so for example, we have the fair dealing exemption using it for personal um, study purposes, you might not be able to reshare that information. So always double check the um, copyright in your data collections. When using secondary data, ask three questions. Who is the copyright of the original data set? Are you al allowed to use them and in what way? And are you allowed to archive and publish them in a repository? If not, you can ask for permission. And again, that might seem tedious, um, but we don't want any copyright infringements. Um, and usually uh, permission is given for the data to be archived. Or if permission is not granted, removing the copyrighted material or thinking of alternative, for example, what if I make the code available so people can download the data from where I got it from and they rerun my code and they create, for example, the derived variables I have. If you have not seen the Daria Elda consent form wizard, please do have a look at it. Again, all the um, slides are available on the Google Drive. Um, it is fantastic. It asks questions directly on your research, the research you want to do, and it gets an information sheet and a consent form that you can use. Um, we have the UKDS model consent form you can use as well. We gave a couple of examples of different consent forms and information sheets used as well and also information around consent for data sharing. Once again, um, this presentation wouldn't have been possible without our colleague Hina. Um, she sadly cannot be here today. Um, and again, any questions, in-depth questions about ethical and legal considerations, if we are not able to, to answer them, please do um, send us your email address and we can always be in touch. So uh, now I can pause the recording. Right, so we'll, we'll give it a go. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Anka Vlad, and uh, I'll be talking to you about management and curation of data for the next um, 30 minutes or so. <laughs> okay, so a summary of this presentation we're going to look at um, anonymization and pseudonymization. Uh, what are they? What are the differences between them? When we would want to use one over the other? Uh, and so on. Then we're going to move on to documentation of data. So when it comes to documenting our data, what we what we need to um, to make sure that we include and we collect and we put together in preparation for um, data sharing and and publishing. Then we're going to look at um, quality assurance and um, some security um, aspects. 
Uh, and then finally, we're going to discuss responsibilities and costing when it comes to data management. Finally, we're going to have a, a Menti exercise, which will cover both um, the presentation that Christina has um, has just been through. Um, so on ethical considerations and um, and the content that we're going to cover in this presentation. So that will be at the end of this. Okay, let's start with the first part. So looking at anonymization and pseudonymization. So um, here we're gonna look at, uh, as I said, uh, we're gonna cover both concepts, what they are uh, and what when they should be used. Um, then we're gonna have a look at our three-tier approach as we call it um, to data sharing. Um, and then, um, uh, a, a quick look at uh, planning to anonymize, how we go about that, and um, you know how to, how we decide how much we anonymize, uh, to what extent, uh, and what are the implications. Okay, so starting with uh, anonymization, pseudonymization. So I'm sure you've heard of both terms, but just um, to give some definitions before we go into differences between them, etc. So uh, anonymized data refers to information which does not um, relate to um, an identified or identifiable natural person. Um, or to personal data rendered anonymous in such manner that the data subject is no longer identifiable. So this data would not include any um, identifiable data. It had, it has been, um, it has gone through a process of processing, um, and in that process, all these um, identifiers, both direct um, and indirect, and we're gonna <laughs> quickly discuss what what those are, um, have been uh, removed in such a way that um, that data has been deemed as anonymized. So we cannot um, we cannot trace it back to to a, a person or to any person. Um, and then pseudonymized data on the other hand is, um, it's also, it also involves the processing of personal data, but in such a manner that the personal data can no longer be um, attributed to a specific data um, subject without the use of additional information. Um, and provided that such additional information is kept separately and um, is subject to organizational measures to ensure that the personal data are not attributed to an identified or identifiable person. Um, so for pseudonymized data, identifiable, identifiable data has been removed or redacted so that it cannot necessarily be traced back. However, pseudonymized data will still contain some um, some information that we refer to as indirect identifiers. So this is not personal information. This is not um, information that would tie directly to one person. However, it, it will include um, demographic information about, um, about uh, research participants, such as, um, I don't know, gender, age, um, uh, ethnicity, uh, income, etc. So it's all information that pieced together could potentially um, lead to identification if someone were to try really hard or link that data to um, external data perhaps that exists out there or to, of course, the key that is being kept um, by the data owner. Okay, so moving on to that three-tier approach that we discussed. So when we think about data sharing um, at the end of our project, of, at the end of our research projects, so as, um, as Christina has already gone through in her presentation, so the first thing we need to consider when it comes to sharing data is um, whether, we, whether we have the appropriate um, consent to do so. Um, and so in this case, before we reach the processes of anonymization or pseudonymization, we need to um, make sure that this is discussed in the consent form. So make sure that the consent form um, covers um, to what extent the data will be made available, right? So, um, and that includes if you're collecting different types of data or if you're planning to make data available at different levels. So you may have the same data set, however, that data set can be made available under different access levels um, and of course that will be anonymized to certain to different extents depending on that access level so you will need to discuss that in your consent form for example um, you may have different um, you know different tick boxes with different um, access levels so you can give your participants the option of sharing pseudonymized data and then of course you would um, include information about what that is exactly and what it will include 
or you can give them the option of sharing anonymized um, uh, their data in an, in an anonymized form, sorry. Um, of course, there are cases as well where you uh, might obtain consent to share data that hasn't been uh, de-identified. There are cases, of course, um, where um, having that uh, when sharing that is 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 very much part of the uh, the research um, project and um, how that data is being analyzed and utilized um, however again if there is consent for that then that is perfectly fine that will need to be very clearly um, addressed in the consent form or or um, an information sheet so if you use this approach correctly, that should enable most data to be shared or archived for reuse. Of course, there will be cases where there will be ethical or legal um, barriers to sharing data. Um, however, this, as I said, this approach, um, if followed correctly, um, it, should, it should allow most data to be, to be shared. Okay, so in terms of planning to anonymize, so how do we know to what extent to pseudonymize or anonymize? Um, as mentioned, so this needs to be uh, addressed in the consent form and the participants need to be made aware of um, to what extent that data can be anonymized or pseudonymized and in what form their data will be shared and they should be given the option to, um, to go for one or another. And of course, once you get to the anonymization um, stage of your, of your project, you will, um, you will process your data according to, to what, they, um, what they wished for. So which one you should go for? Um, so here it's an information, it's a, it's a discussion about data utility and information loss. So when we share our data, we publish our data, either for replication um, or data reuse, um, we need to consider the data utility, right? So the data will be more valuable um, the more information it contains. And so anonymized data, from that perspective is, um, is data that has had the most information loss because we have stripped that data of all that um, valuable information, um, all that detail that might uh, be very useful to future researchers, right? So it might be very useful for someone, for example, to know um, Someone, someone's ethnicity or someone's gender, perhaps someone is doing um, research on um, women only or men only or etc. So it might be very useful to have that information in the data and not have it stripped out or information about, you know, someone's income category um, and where that, that can be very valuable information. Um, and so if we obviously if we strip that out, then data utility will reduce. So from that point of view, um, the more um, the more anonymized the data is, the less valuable it will be. So um, you you need to think about uh, the, uh, the this process when you when you design your consent form, um, just to and and that you explain this to your participants, especially if. Um, perhaps you're having a more um, challenging uh, <laughs> research project where you're collecting sensitive, uh, what are considered to be more sensitive data to participants that you, that you explain to them, um, you know, this, this information loss and, and this value for, for data reuse. Um, and that, of course, it will be only open for, uh, sorry, used for research purposes, etc so that they understand this. Um, and in terms of what access level will apply to my data once it's published. So this really ties to the previous question because of course the access level will be set according to um, how anonymized or how pseudonymized the data is. So what that disclosure risk um, is in the data. Um, a, a general gu guideline, I'm sure you've, you've heard of this expression, is that it should be as open as possible and as close as necessary. So of course, there's a drive for open data and um, you know, we want to have data as, as openly as, an, as, as available as possible um, for, for replication and reuse. However, of course, there are um, situations where that is not possible and rightly so. So for, um, I'm sure we can think of so many ethical reasons why that is the case. And of course, to align with, with disclosure risk. So that will be as closed as necessary. And um, it is just important to, to make sure that, that research participants are made aware of this um, and that, um, 
you know, their data will not just be available <laughs> out there in the open to anyone to, uh, for anyone to use and to explain that there will be uh, very stringent terms and conditions apply to um, data depending on how, um, how much detail it contains. And as Christina explained, um, we have a consent form template that you can use and, and there's so much more guidance available on our website if you'd like to, um, to read on that. And I included here some, um, some resources as well. So in terms of anonymization, so we do run a recurring webinar on, on, on anonymization um, and I included here some other resources as well. Okay, moving on to part two, um, documenting your data. So what is documentation and why it is useful or needed? Um, so documentation will be all the um, context information that you need to provide when when you share your data, right? So you won't just be um, you won't just be archiving um, or publishing the data itself. You will also need to provide um, contextual information about that um, data. So that includes, um, as we'll see. Um, just information about the methodology, uh, the, the population of interest, um, the sample size, etc., cetera, um, all the questionnaires that you used, um, any sort of research instruments that you used as well. Um, and documentation uh, really, uh, really splits into two different types. So we have study level documentation and data level documentation. Um, some examples here, we're going to have a look at an example um, as well, our user guides. Um, um, there's also a piece of documentation that we refer to as a data list, and we also have an example of that. And we're also going to look at um, transcription and, and file formats in this section. Okay, so um, in terms of documentation, so it will, um, what it does, it enables us to understand the data if we were to return to it. And of course, it provides sufficient documentation for any future um, users of the data to understand and use it correctly. So if you're planning on sharing your data and you don't know what documentation uh, will be needed, of course, you need to consult with the repository or the archive where you're planning to share your data. But um, you know, a, a good question to start with, to start with would be, um, if you were to use your data for the first time, what would you need to know to make sense of it, right? So someone with no prior knowledge of the data, what kind of information they will need to, to make correct use of it. So, and of course, uh, at UKE Data Archive and um, at any repository, I should imagine, uh, this is also used to supplement the data collection uh, with documents and also it includes, it ensures that we can um, uh, accurately process and archive the data that you, that you are you're sharing via us or the, the repository of your choice. Um, and that we create that catalog record where people can, can access the data. Okay, um, so as we, as I mentioned, there are two different types of documentation. So just to, to, to start with the first one. So in terms of study level documentation, um, this includes um, any information about the methodology and processes of collecting data. So as I mentioned, sampling, sample size, fieldwork protocol, um, experiment protocol, uh, interviewer instructions, etc. cetera. Um, code book or user guide, that's for quantitative data, um, blank versions of information sheet and consent form. So these will be used by the archive to just establish that, um, um, you know, when we talk about access levels, we will need to look at the consent form and see what the participants agreed to before we um, before we're able to share that data and of course also for um, to check that the anonymization or anonymization has been done correctly according to what the participants agreed to. Then we have questionnaires, showed cards, topic guides, etc. For transcripts, um, make sure that there's a header with context information, uh, the data and place of interview, interviewer, etc. Uh, we have a data list. Um, so this would be an overview of key information about each interview, um, a map of the data collection. We refer to it as a map of the data collection. We have an example as well um, in a future slide. And of course, this will include also links to any reports or publications um, that have already that already exist based on the data, if applicable. Um, and preferably the DOI would be um, uh, 
would be would, would be preferred to have in that case um, because it's a it's a permanent identifier and will um, never cease to exist after after a couple of years as opposed to a, a regular URL. Um, and then we look at um, data level documentation. So um, for this, so the the best practice would be that all structural uh, tabular data should have adequate variable uh, names and um, variable and value labels. So um, just a few guidelines here. So variable names um, should include, uh, so the match, the, the question number system should match the, the questions uh, in the questionnaire. So Q1A, Q1B, et cetera, make sure that there's that, um, that it's consistent with the questionnaire. Um, just use a numerical order system, use meaningful abbreviations, and uh, for interoperability across platforms, just make sure that um, you keep the, the character um, short preferably no longer than eight characters, and don't use any um, spaces. Similar principles for uh, variable labels, so be brief and concise, um, maximum 80 characters, include the, the measurement unit if that is appropriate. Um, reference the, the question number, um, again, so if you're using a different label, um, use uh, make sure that you include any coding or classification schemes that you used um, and of course make sure that for value labels um, you include um, reasons or um, the coding that was used for missing data um, so that you, you make the difference between um, different reasons for missing data um, yeah so if it's a system missing or not recorded or not provided etc um, so as I mentioned, we have an example of a user guide here. So um, what it includes, it should provide just a variety of documents that include that context for your data, whatever applies to your project. Uh, of course, this can vary from project to project. And I included here an example of a user guide. Um, I included here the DOI as well. So you can just click on that and, and see the example. Um, the data list I mentioned again, so this is for qualitative data and it's that map of the collection that we just that um, I touched upon earlier, so this is just a summary of all the um, interview transcripts that appear in that collection in that particular collection, so we have just a summary of um, uh, um, some some. Um, important information to, to, to have about, um, about those transcripts. So um, of course this would vary from project to project. The columns would vary depending on the, the information collected, but this is just useful. Um, if someone were to open that collection, they just open this data list and they see a summary of all the, the data that is present in that collection. And um, it also helps if, for example, someone were to um, only be interested in a subsample of the data that you deposited, um, they can, for example, if they're only interested in um, a size of farm higher than, um, I don't know, 300 hectares, then they will know exactly which, um, which transcript to go to and, and open. Okay, moving on to transcription templates. Um, so when you're when you're um, doing going through transcription, um, just have these have these things in mind. Um, so there should be a unique identifier uh, for each transcript. Um, it should adopt. It should have a uniform layout throughout the research project. Uh, make use of speaker tags, so turn taking, make sure that it's clear who's speaking when, so um, who's asking the question, who's answering, etc. Um, use carry line breaks, um, use page numbering, uh, include a document header as well, um, including all these um, details about, uh, about the interview, so um, the date, the place, the interviewer name, interviewee details. So of course here it's depending on what you have permission to share about those interviewees, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, other considerations, and this is optional, so there should be a cover page. You can include a um, short summary in English. So this is, for example, for transcripts in, in foreign languages. Um, and uh, you can consider compatibility, compatibility with um, uh, import feature of computer um, assisted qualitative data analysis software. 
and in practice, this is how uh, the transcript, uh, uh, how a transcript should look like. And of course we have, um, I included the link at the bottom there for you to, to have a look at if you'd like. So in terms of file formats, again, um, the most important thing to mention here is that they should be um, standard interchangeable and open. So of course, data in the long run will be just as only as valuable as, as the, the file formats we're using. And if those file formats are um, not supported, that software is not supported in the long run, then that is, of course, an issue. Um, I included here a link to um, our um, guideline on guidelines on uh, recommended and acceptable file formats and also uh, a link to the digital preservation coalition as well on preservation formats um, in terms of organizing the data so of course uh, planning in advance is the best <laughs> it's a it's, uh, it's a good thing to do um, and also using a logical structure ensuring that um, collaborators understand of course if it's a bigger research team make sure that that is consistent across all teams um, and that you use a hierarchical structure of files etc group um, files and folders by their type so if you're collecting different types of data um, you know bundle them together etc and use very well um, very well named files also some guidance here um, and I'll let you go through that um, if you haven't checked yet the system data management expert guide please do so um, it's a very good resource um, as well as our um, uh, book uh, we published a book uh, a few uh, colleagues at the UK data service a few years ago including Maureen here <laughs> on managing and sharing research data um, okay, moving on to quality assurance and security. So this is um, a very important um, part, um, just because we want to protect our data from any unauthorized access, use, um, change, uh, disclosure, destruction uh, of our data, of course, uh, that we were not controlling. Um, and that it's, it's always important to know who is who has access to our data or potential access to our data and that we uh, we have that under our control. So in terms of having a data security strategy, so this is uh, just important to have um, control, um, control access to computers. So make sure that you use passwords and, and lock your machine when you're away, of, away from it. Um, you that you have up-to-date antivirus and firewall protection, uh, that you've um, protected your, um, uh, your PC, um, from power search protection, that you have power search protection, um, that you restrict access to sensitive materials. So of course, anything that contains personal data, um, consent for patient records, et cetera, make sure that you keep that separate from the identified data. And um, yeah, so personal data will need more protection. Make sure that you utilize encryption um, on all devices um, and at all locations that you control physical access to buildings, rooms, and filing cabinets. So, you know, ensure that you have a key um, and that there, there is um, there's physical access um, there's, that, that, that is controlled um, into the building where your office is, et cetera. Uh, of course, that might not be under your control, but I'm sure your institution uh, will take um, good care of that. And that you properly dispose of data and equipment once the project is finished. So, of course, this should be included um, in the information sheet or the consent form. And once the project is finished and once you stated that the data will be destroyed, then make sure that that is um, done appropriately. So in terms of encryption software, there are a few options and we do not necessarily recommend one over the other. Um, it's best to just check with your institution. Um, when it comes to this is they will have guidance and they will they will probably just recommend you to use one over um, the other but just keep in mind that encryption is um, is a is, is very important especially when it comes to um, personal data identifiable data um, pseudonymized data <laughs> um, so really the more uh, the more detail the data has in um, the more it should be under encryption um, there are some vid uh, video tutorials here on how to use all the previously mentioned um, um, encryption um, software. Um, so I'll let you go through that if you'd like. And I'll move on to digital backup strategy. So um, 
what is backup um, is basically just having another um, or others, other copies of the data, just to make sure that if you're obviously your one copy um, is malfunctioning. So either perhaps the, the hard drive is malfunctioned or, or the software or, um, you know, there's a fire or anything like that, that you have a backup, uh, backup copy. And there are a few things here to consider. So um, what is backed up? So what you need to back up, where would you back it up? Um, what type of media to use? Again, the answers to these questions would, um, you should discuss this with your institution or university as they might have um, just guidance on how or, or what software to use, etc. cetera. Um, um, for how long it is kept, again, data retention policy, this should be addressed in the consent form or information sheet. Um, and uh, yeah, the general guidance here, the best practice is to have three copies in three separate locations. Um, uh, so just keep that in mind, but again, discuss it with your institution and see what they, uh, what they advise to do. File sharing and collaborative environments. So as, as you, you work in a bigger research uh, team, then you probably need to share data or files with, with your colleagues. So this is this is quite important. Um, just make sure that you don't <laughs> you don't send any um, email attachments that contain any um, problematic uh, <laughs> content, um, especially make sure that you don't send any um, emails that contain personal data um, or just data in general. It's just best to, um, to do that in a more secure way. So here to consider our other options, of course, so we have virtual research environments. Um, these can either be uh, locally managed, um, such as own um, cloud, or we have Zen2 here at the University of Essex. Um, and there are also um, cloud storage solutions. So of course we have Google Drive, Dropbox, et cetera. But um, again, consult with your institution and see what their recommendation is on this. Um, for you to use. Uh, there are more secure options out there. And I listed a few here. They all use end-to-end -end encryption. Um, they're all, um, they all have different characteristics. And, um, but again, consult with your institution and, uh, and see what, what, uh, what they recommend to, to use. Um, in terms of file disposal, uh, sorry file data disposal. So um, just make sure that this is uh, done properly. So um, any equipment or media that you've used or you've stored the data um, or any files during your project, just make sure that this is properly disposed of at the end of your project. So um, if in doubt, always destroy, <laughs> destroy the drive. Um, again, this is just uh, just being extra cautious but in this case again consult with your institution and see what what they what their advice is on this and um what um what they recommend doing in this in this case um when it comes to data disposal i listed some options here um and they're both um very good in our opinion however again consult with your institution and see what what they advise and finally, uh, on responsibility and costing. So um, what is very important to, ha uh, to keep in mind throughout a, a research project is who is responsible uh, for data management at large and also um, what, who is responsible for different aspects of data management. So ensure that this is just clearly defined in your DMP. And uh, of course, the DMP is, is, should be a living document. So keep an eye on this throughout the research project. If this changes at any point, make sure that that is, um, that is updated and that you, of course, use version control. <laughs> um, just keep in mind that um, this is often uh, the principal investigator that is responsible for data management. However, that's not necessarily the case. There can be other members of the research team that can be responsible for different aspects of data management. Uh, so some can be responsible for, for storage, others for anonymization, others for archiving, etc. cetera. Um, so just the, the most important thing here is just to decide who's, who is responsible for what, um, for what aspect and to record that. Um, costing data management. So of course, it's very important to, to have a, an eye on costs and budget throughout a research project, as I'm sure you know. Um, and it's also important to include this in your DMP, just to ensure that um, you keep that under control. 
and that you, you can plan and manage any, any expenses. Um, make sure they include people's time. So in this, um, in this section, any equipment, any infrastructure, um, tools that you might need to, to manage or document or organize um, or provide access to data. So on average, we say that two, three weeks um, costed into a typical two year uh, research grant application just to prepare and collate materials for deposit. Um, this is, of course, on average, so um, that, that might vary depending on, on the project, of course. Um, at the UKDS, we also have a costing tool, um, which can um, give you an idea of what are the different aspects that you should consider when it comes to costing that, might, that you might need to, to include in that, in that section and keep an eye on. Um, so I included a link here. Please uh, have a look at that. So in terms of expense, um, examples of uh, expenses, um, so that might be um, any budget that you need to uh, allocate to data cleaning, formatting, uh, anonymization. So this might be time perhaps to pay a research assistant to do that or um, a member of the team. Transcription and digitization, documentation. So creating all that, um, the user guide, the data list, etc. cetera. Um, storage, uh, whether that is something that you have to pay for or not, or perhaps your institution is taking care of that. Um, just, just you need to, to, um, to just do that, that, those background checks uh, to see who's responsible for that and who's paying for that. Um, backup, as we've seen, um, Consent, again, if you have to do retrospective consent, that can be expensive. Um, copyright, again, the time that perhaps is needed to obtain all the permissions uh, necessary to share uh, copyrighted data. Um, so these are all, all examples of expenses that might uh, incur in a research project. Okay, and I think the presentation is finished now. Um, I, <laughs> I am aware that I'm a bit over time. Um, I flew a bit through some of the slides, but um, hopefully there should be uh, links for you to, to read more in your own time. And now we have a Mentimeter exercise, and I'm just going to stop sharing uh, my screen just so I can get that on. Okay, so as I said, it will cover both um, management and creation of data. Um, so I think at this point, um, we'll have about 12 questions and about 10 minutes. Um, hopefully this should have been edited and um, apologies for that. I forgot, to, I forgot to add that. I think there are about 12 questions. Um, to, to cover here. Um, so to, to join this, uh, please go to uh, www.menti.com. And once you do that, um, you can use a separate tab in your computer or you can use another device. Um, so your phone or your tablet and you just be asked for a code and um, please use the code on the screen. I believe it might also go on the chat. Um, I'm just going to share the Mentimeter. While everybody is joining, Okay, so um, you should already be prompted with the first question. Um, we just wanted to know um, what type of data you're working with, um, whether it's quantitative, qualitative, uh, both, um, or perhaps you're still preparing for your project, so you're not sure yet.
Okay, so it seems that most uh, most of you here are using both. Uh, it's good. I see we also have 13, 14 people that have now joined. Okay. You should still be able to follow the exercise on the screen, even if you're not able to um, join Menti, although hopefully everybody, everybody is able to join. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next question. What do you think are your ethical obligations as a researcher when sharing um, your research data for future reuse? And you should be able to um, submit more than one answer if you wish, or any comments. Um, this is just um, really a discussion we can we can go through. And um, as Christina covered the ethical and legal obligation presentation, um, Christina, feel, please um, feel free to interrupt me um, at any point if you'd like. Okay, so in terms of ethical uh, obligations for us as researchers when, um, when sharing research data, that the data is clearly described. Um, yes, that we minimize risk to participants. Yes, that is very good. That we ensure consent anonymization copyright is in place. Indeed, very good. Compliance with ethics principles and laws. Yes, uh, that's correct. Um, making sure participants are informed about um, reuse and consent is obtained. Yes. Um, this is all very good, ask for consent. Do not harm to respondents, try to keep data as useful as possible. Very good, yes. <laughs> so this is, uh, um, I, I'm glad I see this answer um, in line with that, you know, as, as open as possible, as close as necessary. Um, data is easy to find to those who find it helpful. Yes, that is very good. So, um, you know, thinking about how, what are some principles that we can we can uh, use to guide ourselves when we publish our data, and those will be mentioned, I'm sure, uh, in, in other presentations. And I'm sure if you know already, they're called the fair principles. Um, and yes, they may, they ensure that data is is, is findable. That's what F stands for in 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 fair. Um, respect for participants' rights. Yes, uh, very good. Not breaching copyright when sharing information. Uh, try to contribute to the body of knowledge. Yes, this is all very good. Uh, very good responses. Um, and yes, I think they they have covered pretty much everything we were we were uh, expecting to to cover by this question. Um, if Christina doesn't have any, any other comments, then I will move on to the next question. Is the statement, um, I understand that only the research team will have access to the data I will provide appropriate to use. So what um, is, is this appropriate to use in a, in a, in a consent form uh, and why not, do you think? Not is enough to say is missing. Yes, yes. yes. If not sharing, yes, sharing. Yes, not sharing. Not sharing. Not sharing. Land. Land. Um, no, this is no, really this true. Is really true. Uh, no, uh, the data, no, yes, data. so um, what this statement, if we were to include the statement in a, in a participant uh, information sheet or consent form, what would do, it would preclude us to sharing that um, with anybody outside, um, anybody outside the research team, right? So um, data sharing is, of course, um, not, not covered in that, um, uh, so that is, that is an issue. Uh, of course, from from uh, from that perspective, um, yes, it is not enough. Right. Very good. So all comments are in line with that. Uh, yes, the data cannot be shared. 
Okay, moving on. So what projects need a data management plan? Um, is it only UKRI funded projects, uh, projects collecting new data, ESRC funded projects, um, or perhaps not sure? Okay, I'll see the <laughs> answers are um, all projects. And that is, uh, that is very good. I'm glad that is the answer. Uh, because that is the correct answer. Um, so all projects, all research projects should ideally have a data management plan um, for all the reasons why uh, we, we discussed uh, already, um, a data management plan can, can help us so much. Okay, so moving on, um, a DMP should be a living document. Is that true, false, or not sure? Yes, that is true. Uh, very good. Um, yes, so DMP should be a living document. So just for, I see there's two <laughs> answers and not sure. So what this means is that just that the data management plan needs to be updated throughout um, the research project. So if there are any new developments um, in, in any aspects of the, of uh, any, any aspects covered by the data management plan that should be recorded and that um, that document should be updated. That what this that is what this is uh, referring to. Okay, just, so just sorry. one thing to add here. Um, this has actually proven with the pandemic. I would say um, a lot of data management plans have had to be changed throughout the pandemic because researchers might have not been able to collect the data they wanted. They changed a little bit the focus of the research. So that's why we think of a DMP as a living document because so many external factors can come in and keeping it up to date, it actually ensures we let the funder know things have changed. It allows us to actually archive what we should be archiving. Um, so just a comment around the pandemic um, it's a hot topic, so I said, why not? <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Yeah, that's a very good point and a very good example of why this is important. Um, okay, moving on. Um, when is data sharing not possible? And please select all that apply here. So uh, when the consent form did not cover data sharing, uh, when the data is sensitive, when the participant opted out, uh, when the risk of identification is present, all of the above. What do you think is the case here? <clears throat> okay. So um, I see the most popular answer is that the consent form did not cover data sharing. So um, the I, I will just take every. Um, I'm I'm very much aware of time, but uh, so I'll try to be brief about this. Um, in the case, in the first case, so the consent form did not cover data sharing. Of course, that is not ideal and it should have. However, um, there are still, um, there's still the option of having your respective consent. So that is not necessarily the end of the road there. Of course, if, um, uh, if, uh, if recounting the participants is not an option either, then that is not, of course, it's the end of the road again, but um, retrospective consent is theoretically still a possibility there. Uh, in the case of data sensitive, that is, um, again, not the end of the road in terms of data sharing. Um, there's so much, uh, <laughs> it's so much discussion around this, and I'm sure Maureen can, um, can, can talk so, so much on this topic on why uh, data that is sensitive is not, is, is not an issue for data sharing necessarily. Um, a participant has opted out. Yes, indeed, this is probably the only case here presented here where um, there's no way around that. If the participant has said that they don't want their data to be shared, then there is nothing um, it can be done there and it's there, uh, there's a right to, to choose. So um, uh, if the risk, risk of identification is present, again, that is not the end of the road and data should still be able to be shared. Um, again, we talked about anonymization, so anonymization access controls. So um, data should still be able to be shared as long as um, the appropriate permissions are in place via the consent form. Okay, um, let's move on to the next question. Um, who is responsible for data management in the research team? So is it the PI, co-investigators, 
needs to be delegated for each project, um, the data support officer, or uh, we're not sure. Okay, so I see the, the most um, uh, popular answer is to be delegated. And yes, as we discussed in the, um, in the presentation earlier, so um, this can be decided within the research project. Um, of course, this also depends on the size of the, the research team. If it's a very small project and there's only one person, then of course that person would be the PI and would be responsible for data management. However, um, in bigger projects, um, it might be that um, different people are uh, responsible for different aspects of data management that that's just needs to be mentioned in the data management plan um, and uh, of course decided within, within the team. So to be delegated is the, res the correct response here. Um, okay, what should be added under costing in a data management plan? Uh, and we have translation, transcription, um, storage and backup, all of the above. It is uh, easy. <laughs> it is quite a giveaway here, all of the above. So yes, that is correct. That is um, just three examples of, of what could be added under costing. Of course, there's, there's quite a few more um, aspects that we need to keep in mind, but um, Yes, that is correct. That is all of, all of the above. Backup. How many copies of the data should we have, ideally? Is it two, three, one is enough, or are we not sure? Okay, so I see the most common answer is three here. And yes, that is correct. Um, best practice is just to have three copies, just in case uh, we, you know, we want to avoid any um, just to be, be extra secure, um, just in case two of the copies will by accident uh, malfunction or be in a fire or be stolen, etc. We still want uh, one, uh, one copy of the data. Um, and I can't tell you how many examples have there been on social media of, oh, I forgot my only copy of the data in a train um, and uh, my... Uh, <laughs> My project was obviously obviously affected by that, um, and so yes, best to be extra extra safe, extra secure, and have three copies. Um, okay, moving on. Um, what are causes of data loss? Um, and you can select all that apply here. So we have hardware failure, software malfunction, uh, malware and, and hacking, uh, human error, theft, um, natural disaster, fire. Uh, we're not sure. So these are all causes really um, where we can lose data and how uh, data backup can really um, can really help us. You know, of course, if we have an extra copy of the data or in our case, because we are extra safe, we will have two extra copies of the data. <laughs> um, so, yes, that's correct. Uh, they're all um, they're all uh, causes of data loss that we can prevent by uh, backing up data. OK. Moving on to the next question. According to studies, what incentives motivate researchers to archive and publish their data? And you can select all that apply here. So we have career benefits, scientific progress, norms, or external drivers. Okay, so um, we have answers for each category, and that's good. They're all they're all reasons to, uh, and incentives to that motivate researchers to archive and publish their data. So it has been reported uh, by by researchers that they've seen career benefits from sharing data. Um, of course, for scientific progress. Um, replication and reuse of that data um, norms um, it, it's just it's just how it's meant to be it's how it, it is done and and everybody uh, needs to do it so um, and then external drivers perhaps your your funder requires you to to share that or or the journal where you're publishing your um, your paper Okay, so they're all incentives um, to share data. And here are some studies that confirm that um, if you want to, to uh, read a bit more on that. Uh, okay, let's move on to the next question. So articles um, for which data, the underlying data is published are more frequently cited than articles for which this is not the case. Is that true? or false or we not sure okay um 
Um, so the correct answer here, it is, it is true. So articles for which the underlying data is published are more frequently cited. Um, and the next slide, uh, we have the studies that confirm that. Um, so uh, that would be, that would be an extra incentive to, <laughs> to, to share your data um, or your research outputs, your code, uh, for example. Okay, um, the final um, question, I think um, it is recommended that data is um, published or archived as soon as collection ends. Um, why? So you can select all that applies here. Um, so knowledge about the data is highest, um, least time to prepare. Um, so least time to prepare data or documentation, metadata, um, highest data quality, um, archives would not accept it later or not sure. Okay, so <laughs> the first three answers here are, are what really um, are, is why it's recommended to, to have your data um, shared or archived as soon as you're published. Your, your project then. So your, your knowledge about the data will be um, at, its highest peak, at the highest point. Um, there'll be less time to prepare because you'll have that knowledge of the data um, and, and how, you, how you stored it, structured it, et cetera. And uh, you'll have the highest data quality um, as well. Um, archives will not accept, accept it later. That is not, um, that is not necessarily true. So um, yeah, we were going for the first three answers. And I think that is the end of the presentation and the Menti exercise. Um, I think we are, are we moving to, are we answering any questions? Oh yeah, if there are any questions about the presentation, um, anything that we discussed, any um, questions on the mentee? Um, promise, can... um, thank you so much, Anka. As promised, we will stop the recording now. And um, hopefully some people will um, unmute themselves so we can discuss more. So we'll stop the recording. So we are at the end of day one. Thank you all ever so much once again for joining us. Um, I do hope you have found today useful and have learned a lot. So we have looked at the structure of DMPs. As we can see, there are different templates. So always check what template DMP should you use. Um, of course, we have the core principles that should be covered in a DMP. So for example, if your research is not part of a funded project or your institution doesn't have requirements specific to DMPs, you can always use the core sections of a DMP to prepare one. We have looked at key principles and standards that should be included in DMPs and also ethical and legal considerations. We have gone through anonymization and how to document data but also how to assure quality assurance and that security and backup is all in place. Finally, we have looked at different responsibilities and costing. And again, can't um, stress enough how important it is to make sure that the costing is done properly. And you think in time, and this is why the data management plan helps, because you think in time, okay, so preparing data for deposit, I will need X amount of hours to prepare the documentation, X amount of hours to clean the data, et cetera, et cetera. Tomorrow we'll be looking at existing data sources and secondary data use considerations. And we're also going to be having an exercise. Uh, we're going to open breakout rooms and you're more than happy to join a breakout room with us. Or if you feel more comfortable doing the um, exercise by yourself, that is all, all fine. And all the materials will be made available and you can use them in your own training and taking under a CC BY license. We're going to be looking at common challenges in data sharing. And we are actually going to open a separate Padlet in which we ask you to actually provide us your challenges. Have you encountered any challenges and what they were? And also compare it to 
common challenges that we find from a um, data repository perspective. We do have um, a short um, showcases presentation around practices to enable data sharing. We're going to be looking at a couple of examples when initially data sharing seemed to be impossible. There's no way out. Um, however, um, the data was able to be shared. Now, uh, finally, um, in case you don't you didn't know, um, it is the Love Data Week um, of 2022 from February uh, 14th to 18th of February. Um, if you have a look on Twitter, for example, for the hashtag Love Data 2022, you'll find a variety of events that are happening throughout the week to actually celebrate our love for data. Um, a lot of events from the States, from Europe as well. Um, so please do, please do have a look. But we do hope you'll join us tomorrow for the second day um, and that not another event will be um, stealing you. And finally, this is by no means only if you have um, time. Um, I've just prepared a very, very short menti um, with what have you most enjoyed of today. It can be an interesting uh, thing. It can be a specific presentation anything that you've um, enjoyed today, only if you have time, if you go to Menti, voting code is 41317446. Um, if you'd like to complete it, thank you ever so much, but no worries if you don't have time to. Um, it's probably um, lunchtime for everyone as well. We have been here for two hours and a half, um, but thank you all ever so much for your attention. The slides are on the Google Drive, um, and we're also going to be uploading the recordings as soon as we've edited them. Um, please do share them with your colleagues um, and make them available as widely as possible. Thank you all ever so much, and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>